So a lot of y'all ask me, Derek, how do you harvest so much money from kids when you can't write? Well, I mean, I don't have a single skill or talent at all. I just shout at kids and pretend that I do. But I have a video here. It's about Steve Ditko's Mr. A. Mr. A debuted in 1967 within the pages of Wally Wood's anthology comic, Wit's End. Mr. A would then appear in a variety of fan scenes and underground comics throughout the late 60s and early 70s. Some of those obscure appearances were eventually compiled into Mr. A No. 1, published in 1973. The creator, Steve Ditko, would continue to write, draw, and self-publish Mr. A stories throughout the rest of his career. Even with a casual glance, one can easily determine that Mr. A is not a traditional comic book hero. He neither has superpowers nor an origin story. One day the intrepid, morally rigorous... Wow, so Isom. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. <laughs> Listen, it has not established that Mr. A can extend his thumbs to be like normal fingers. Come on. <laughs> That's true. That's true reporter, Rex Grain, decided to put on a white mask and an all-white suit. Then he began to dole out justice with his fists and a gun. There's no inciting incident. There's no call to action. There's no training montage with the New Wave soundtrack. <laughs> There's just some guy with too much free time who is driven by the need to force others to conform to his beliefs concerning proper moral behavior. Or suffer the consequences. Mr. A's civilian identity is basically indistinguishable from his hero identity. The white mask he wears to disguise him. Yeah, I, I, lot, the chat's bringing up Rorschach a lot, and I think that's a great uh, comparison. Because, like, well, I mean, he, he literally inspired him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, that was a literal. Okay. Yes. Well, yes. I, I, okay. Well, that makes sense then. But yeah, uh, I think like. I think especially in the Zack Snyder movie, which I enjoy, but like it, it gets worse with age and that series didn't do it any favors because that series was amazing. But uh, uh, looking back at Rorschach, like there's a degree of like almost making him like try to be as much a hero as possible in that movie, which is not what the book does. And it misses the point of the character because the character is just he's nuts. And I think Alan Moore was very like very much saw him as being absolutely insane. Um, well, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I actually think I have a might have a link about this that Alan Moore specifically. Let's see. Yep. Yep. He did. So Alan Moore uh, created Rorschach to dunk on. Uh, well, to dunk on Randy and superheroes. So this is uh, mm -hmm. from Polygon. Um, Rorschach, whose visage is prominently featured in HBO's new Watchmen series, is a, a growly detective who wears a mask, hunts criminals, and refuses to compromise on his principles. That sounds familiar. Rorschach isn't parroting the icon with pointy ears and a cape. His black and white moral ideals are a political philosophy that Watchmen's writer Alan Moore found laughable, not laudable. Uh, and then it goes into how he's, you know, because a lot of people, and I used to think this, that Rorschach was the Batman, or one of the mm -hmm. Batman, you know, but like at the time that the Watch, that Watchmen was created, Batman wasn't what we know him yet. He wasn't as dark and broody as, as he, he's known to be now in the comics. That was... yeah. You know, it's kind of happening somewhat at the same time almost, but not, yeah. not yet. Rorschach is based on Mr. A. Rorschach owes his ideals, his visual design, and his penchant for violence to a couple of other characters who were doing the late 80s Batman thing way before Batman. Namely, the vigilante detectives known as The Question and Mr. A. Mr. A first appeared in, yep. So, and then less than a year after Mr. A debuted was when The Question debuted uh, in a backup feature of Blue Beetle. I don't know. I, I just I just love the idea of a character being introduced. No, no origin story. Just uh, this guy who pops up and, and, and fights people. I, I can't imagine a modern day uh, version of that uh, or what it would be called. Um, yeah. uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of both. Either They're not like necessarily one to one. Right. Like, there's, yeah, there's a little bit of mixture in there. There's, there's that, amalgamations going on there, too, yeah. <laughs> yup. Um, you know, everybody seems ins to insist that it's just one character. Uh, but yeah, so this this is why this shit doesn't work as a superhero. That's why he's not a superhero. Um, mm -hmm. You can't enforce your morality on everyone or beat the shit out of them, especially, you know, like, when your morality is so hyper-specific and, like, you know, I mean, like, your if your morality is, hey, don't hurt people, don't fucking murder people, 
yeah, that's all right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Enforce that morality on people. Why not? But like, if it's, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe he'll get into some of the details here. Self is literally his own face displaying a disdainful, condescending expression. If you think about it, it's not really a mask. It's a frozen declaration of what Mr. A feels towards those he deems criminals. It's probably more accurate to call Mr. A a comic book protagonist, not a hero. And Mr. A's primary antagonist is, roughly, everyone who isn't Mr. A. <laughs> Steve Ditko Jesus. created the character shortly after he quit working on the extremely popular comic book he co-created and co-wrote, Spider-Man. While Ditko worked on Spider-Man, he discovered and was subsequently influenced by objectivism, the mode of philosophy founded by Ayn Rand. So it was while he worked on Spider-Man. God, I, man, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to see a movie about that. Just like Ditko yeah. working on Spider-Man, and then he discovers objectivism, and then just like increasingly becomes like, oh, I fucking hate this character. <laughs> yeah, he he <laughs> would like Spider-Man is not a libertarian. No matter what you say about him, like his his philosophy is not libertarian whatsoever. <laughs> Christ. This influence and in Ditko's understanding of objectivism became the foundation of this character. To truly understand Mr. A's motivations and reasoning, you need a very basic Wikipedia level of understanding about <laughs> objectivism. Luckily, the founder of objectivism, Ayn Rand, summarized the philosophy herself in the afterword to Atlas Shrugged, so I can just directly quote her. My philosophy, in essence, is the concept of man as a heroic being, with his own happiness as the moral pursuit of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. Ditko's interest in upholding... So, you know, and that's funny because, like, they're talking about reason being an absolute... That, that's, you know, could be a good... Well, not absolute, but, like, yeah. you know, empathy is also important. But reason is a good thing. But the people that are always espousing reason, mm -hmm. usually the most unreasonable people, like they just, you know, really suck at, at well, reasoning I, things. I see you well, have I this think, clip here. Yeah, I have a, a Anne Rand. I was thinking when we, we go over it, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah. But oh, I have Anne Rand talking about uh, the value of uh, selfishness. But like, um, what was I going to say? You got me derailed. God damn it. Sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So like, uh, Anne Rand was huge huge into being reason essentially reason um almost kind of i don't want to say logic but like yeah kind of just being reasonable and it was to the point that a lot of people like to forget this because uh it goes against a lot of people who push and Rand, Rand like to forget this aspect of her she was vehemently anti-religion like she thought religion was like just a rot on fucking society and he gutted and got done away with. Mm. Um, I'm sure I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's one of her few base takes from like, I'm OK, I, I, I see where you're going. <laughs> but like, yeah, she to she at least to a degree, like followed reason to a logical course. Like she yeah. she. Well, the thing is, you got that, some like, bad takes, but yeah. <laughs> well, like the people that, that tend to, uh, you know, espouse reason, like absolute reason in this way, they they discount things that are real things that are part of humanity, which like empathy and compassion and and, you know, the, the uh, collective good being good for everyone. And, and, you know, like things that it's like it's only their form of reason, the specific and the human mind can justify a lot of shit. You know, it can it can convince itself a lot of stuff is reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. when it's when it's not necessarily true so mm -hmm. like it just i don't know pointing to reason is like your ultimate authority on something as if like your singular reason is the only thing that should matter is you know not only does it insist on uh uniformity uh or because the only options there are uniformity or just constant conflict with everyone around you um you know what i mean it, it i don't know it's it's just when you when you take any kind of uh, empathy or like uh, anything like that out of the, out of the equation, then you have no room for other experiences, and that's what tends to. That's why these people are right leaning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like they don't. That's why they think that uh, gay people or trans people are weirdos or whatever the yeah. fuck because that's not their experience. So to them, it's unreasonable. It's irrational because mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't understand it. <laughs> oh, Get it? so um, you know, if you don't understand it you know, like you don't understand a lot of things, then you're going to, you're going to, I don't know, it, you're going to be urged July. Let's watch this. The objectivist principles inspired him to create a hero that exemplified the rules he believed to be important. Namely, there is good and there is evil. 
and there is nothing in between. It's also hard not to notice the similarities between Mr. A and another Ditko creation. The question. Both were created at roughly the same time in 1967 and somewhat embody the same view of the world. However, the question is an intentionally compromised, comics code friendly version of Mr. A. The main difference between the two being, the question upheld traditional hero values, while Mr. A was guided by a new, very strict philosophy. Mr. A is the personification of one of the most well-known objectivist principles, A is A, which is, by the way, totally taken from Aristotle's law of identity. Basically, this means that reality is self-evident. It exists, and its existence isn't open to interpretation. Following that logic, good and evil also exist, so that that right there kind of does explain why somebody would just uh you know be vehemently opposed to any perspective or lived experience that isn't theirs because mm -hmm. you know to them the reality is what it is it's what i've experienced and you know you should be experiencing the same thing too and if you're not then there's something wrong with you kind of thing um, i mean you could also use that argument to to debunk a lot of their stuff because essentially they're they're arguing you know uh you know, oh well, a, you know, A is A. You know, if it, if, it, if it's if it's A and it's saying it's not A, then you know that's wrong. But like, you know, here's here's a simple fact about reality: trans people exist, gay people mm -hmm. exist, women exist, um, and just ignoring that is is violating this rule. But the female so, orgasm does not exist. God damn it! Oh dear, <laughs> oh dear. We we should have discussion after chat. Um, we, right, we got some stuff to go over, Dane. Um, okay, right. <laughs> maybe maybe I've been wrong. All right. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. It's uh th these things exist. They they deny them. They deny the overwhelming medical consensus mm -hmm. about trans people. They deny, uh, you know that that like they deny that Captain Marvel was made over a billion dollars because people kept seeing it and liked it. Uh, you know things like that. It's just they they've got a. Mm -hmm. They've got their weird fucking excuses for everything that doesn't fit their their whole thing. Um, I'm just not doing it right. Doing what right? <laughs> See, Galvatron, oh. you have to you have to be doing something to not do it right. So, gotcha. Oh no, Boom. zing! I don't. I don't think you owned him. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> and the difference between the two are self-evident and not open to interpretation. Admittedly, that's a very rudimentary examination of objectivism, but these are the highlights you need to know to understand the character of Mr. A. Mr. A is a man that holds the overly simplistic worldview that the path of a righteous, purposeful life is obvious, and we should all strive for that level of perfection, regardless of the self-sacrifice it may require. Though so really, this is just like how a fucking you know, uptight dickhead justifies being an uptight dickhead. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, they're, they're rigid minded, um, you know, low emotional intelligence. It just, yeah. I mean, I, it, it kind of makes sense with all the people that I've known that have identified with this philosophy. Uh, respectfully, you guys aren't, uh, grasping Steve Ditko's work. He explores topics. He doesn't preach or push them. Um, I don't know that I don't know that we said he was preaching or pushing them in like respectfully. I don't think you're presenting uh, uh, any kind of argument against what we're actually saying. Do you do you see what he's saying? Oh, like, um, I'm not sure. Like, like, I, I guess, Mike, are you trying to say like Mr. A is a criticism of libertarianism in the way that Steve get go explores him? Because I'll admit I haven't read it like I just know of him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what I what I know of him, he, he seems like a libertarian dickhead. Um, yeah. Well, like, I mean, I know the one thing uh, thing I know that happens in a Mister A story that I don't remember for sure from watching a video a long time ago is that at some point there's some lady that gets in with I think the mob or something, and then she runs afoul of them, and then they're gonna like kill her, and they're up on top of a building, I believe, and they're gonna drop her like the mobster is going to like throw her off the building and then mr a shows up and he he uh you know she's hanging off the edge of the building and mr a like throws him over the edge of the building and kills the mobster guy but then he refuses to help her up because like basically she got herself put in that situation or some shit like that and it's like um 
if, if that's exploring, you know, and I mean, another thing is it kind of seems like you're saying you're saying this in response to something else. So I don't know if you mean that is in like, I, I don't know. I just would need to know more where you're coming from. Yeah. Like again, like maybe, maybe he does that. Like, is there a reflection after that scene where like, you know, the comic book is pointing out how messed up that is. Yeah. There you go. I don't yeah, know. It's... It really does seem like that. Yeah. Those that refuse to accept this basic perspective and act accordingly are left to meet their fate, which yeah. is usually both tragic and fatal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mr. A only sees issues in black and white, good and evil, right and wrong. Within that point of view is the arrogant confidence that his moral position is the only correct position. This is his reality, and it is inflexible. In order for this character to uh skull man dude you're coming in here fucking coming in here hot you know it's one thing if you want to say something positive about Zack snyder i i've got some negative things that i think about him but i'm not going to like get upset if you have if you want to say positive things but like nobody's talking about james gunn so if you're coming in here to do this fucking anti james gunn fucking snyder cult fucking bullshit you can fuck off because it's fucking dumb and and it's and not it's it's old man um like yeah. i i hate to point this out Zack Snyder's not come back to do any more Justice League movies. Just please move on. I did just <sighs> let's give James Gunn a shot because he hasn't had a chance to do anything yet. All he's done is a fantastic Suicide Squad movie, a fantastic Peacemaker series, and three fantastic Guardians of the Galaxy movies. So let's give him a serious shot with DC. That's all yeah, I'm saying. The next one might be where he fucks it up. Um Anyway, um, I mean, you uh, let's see. You weren't responding, Julie, because you're mentioning James Gunn, and nobody fucking mentioned James Gunn. So, no need to bring him up uh, unless you're bringing some of your weird shit in here. It's the last I'm going to tell you. Bye. To work as intended, Mr. A can never waver. He can never have a moment of self doubt. He can never challenge his own perceptions and conclusions. He can only dismiss contradictions and justifications. And where applicable, Mr. A will literally beat his convictions into another person. From Mr. A's perspective, violence is not an unreasonable reaction to a situation. It is the logical application of the code of conduct established by his opponent. When challenged with violence, he returns the challenge in a disproportionate manner. Of course, being a righteous individual, Mr. A always triumphs. This reinforces yeah. his moral superiority. Overall, Mr. A is quite literally a one-note character. <laughs> that note being, I am right, you are wrong. End of discussion. The stories involving Mr. That That's exactly how I see some people sometimes try to, like, portray Batman or, you know, even just superheroes in general. They'll, you know, non-superhero mm -hmm. non fans will try to present all superheroes that way. Yeah. Uh, which is bullshit. Mr. A are, well, there's no polite way to say this. They're terrible. They aren't actual stories, to be honest. They're like morality plays with a transparently thin premise that allows Mr. A to defeat a wrongdoer while speechifying about right and wrong and the moral duty of the individual. Eventually, Ditko drops the pretense of there being even the slightest hint of a story and just has Mr. A lecture the reader directly. Oh, sounds cool. This approach cool. to storytelling <laughs> hits a new level of absurdity when all character dialogue becomes unrealistic monologues. Seriously. Let's look at some of this here. Who cares about your consent or your rights? We're taking what we have. No right to take. Uh, we have no right to take because we, by force, like, force is law, protecting the special privilege. Holy shit, this is just a guy screaming this as he beats somebody up. And he's, he's. My God. Who right? I guess Steve gets Steve Ditko Ditko. writes this, but oh my God. Like, they're, they're... this is dialogue? Fuck. I mean... <laughs> Christ, man. All right. <laughs> Who talks like this? <laughs> no you. one. No one talks yeah. like this ever. In all, this is what this is exactly what Chuds are always. Th th what it seems like they think Marvel comics are doing whenever they have like a character say like I'm I'm gay and they think that yeah. that character is just being like doing this. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, it's not. You know what I mean? Like I, I read a lot of comics. I don't if I, if, you know, sometimes there's stuff that seems a little weird and uh, forced or something, but like rarely. 
and not really in the last few years there hasn't been any of it there was they had somewhat of an argument in certain comics yeah like in the 2015 2016 they were there were a few things that were like okay you're trying a little too hard here marvel uh and then but in the last several years there's just been fucking awesome comics um and they still are running those same narratives right um but yeah you talk like that when you're drunk fair enough are you beating people up when you do that though <laughs> yeah like, i know i get really drunk and i go force is law protecting the special privilege and <laughs> yeah no that's that's exactly why i say when i'm drunk by the way <laughs> yeah <laughs> just become a Jesus libertarian Christ. and start quoting and rand <laughs> fairness, Ditko isn't writing characters. He's writing personifications of bad human behavior. The people in these stories, so to speak, are simply there. It's already back, buddy. I read it this morning. It came out today. It's fucking awesome. Jerry Duggan fucking killing it. Fucking great. This Fall of X stuff. Sorry, I know it's completely off topic, but like post or I guess the during the Fall of X is what this is called. But like after the, the big deal at the uh, Hellfire Gala, that whole sh those shenanigans, there's some awesome shit happening. The X Men, the mutants are all spread out across the world. They're getting involved with different things. Then you know the status quo's up, up, upended, and I'm loving it. I'm just loving it, man. They're doing good stuff. All right, that's all. To argue with Mr. A, their actions and reactions are overly simplified and easily invalidated by Mr. A's superior moral position. They are straw men, but Ditko doesn't pretend they are otherwise. Regardless, when one needs to resort to that level of manipulation, they've completely invalidated the argument they're trying to make. Despite these criticisms, one can't help feeling a sense of fascination about Ditko's work on Mr. A. This is a creator passionate about the work and the message he's trying to get across. It's teeming with frustration about a world that not only tolerates the worst we're capable of being, but then provides excuses for that terrible behavior. Steve Ditko, much like his character, Mr. A, lived his life upholding the principles of objectivism. Due to his dedication to this philosophy, Ditko did not give any interviews. Ditko simply did the work and, as he stated many times to those who attempted to interview him, he let that work speak for itself. That was all he was willing to say about his creative output. There are two notable exceptions. I mean, that tells you a lot right there, because if, if, he, if he wants to criticize this, and, you know, and he knows his people taking it seriously, interviews and stuff would be the way to clarify that, that to go out there and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doing like I found this thing called objectivism. I thought it was silly. I'm kind of doing a, a parody of it. Like that's that'd be his opportunity to make start making it very clear. Um, you don't say, oh, well, the work speaks to itself. That's yeah. Yeah. In 1989, Ditko recorded a five and a half minute spoken word piece for the documentary masters of comic book art oh in that piece he read a prepared statement that outlined his approach to what defines a hero it slightly comes off as a rambling commercial for objectivism the second instance was in 1999 when he produced a four-page comic book essay that very obliquely addressed the creation of spider-man this was in response to stanley's public written statement that he considered ditko to be the co-creator of spider-man while somewhat unclear in the essay, one can infer that Ditko objected to the co-creator's status, because Lee merely had the idea, and it was Ditko that brought the character to life. One can further infer that Ditko believed he deserved the sole credit. Lee facilitated the process, but it was Ditko who realized... Okay, so this is where it gets kind of right at the heart of this issue, right? Because it's literally impossible for him to have given Spider-Man life if he was believing in this shit at this point. Yeah. Like, no, if he wrote Spider-Man like Mr. A, we wouldn't have Spider-Man. We wouldn't talk about Spider-Man. Spider-Man is arguably the most popular superhero, period. Like, mm -hmm. end of story. Um, I, I think there's a strong argument for that. Mm -hmm. Nobody would know who he was if he was, like, a Mr. A-like character. Because, well, you know, people who know Mr. A might be familiar with Spider-Man. And I'm it. not... I'm not a Stan Lee, like just a simp for Stan Lee. Like he definitely, uh, you know, didn't give credit to Kirby on things where he yeah. should have things and, like that. But like, but these there's people that just want to discredit Stan Lee entirely is mm -hmm. fucking, I've seen it where they're just like, no, you know, yeah. he doesn't really, he didn't do shit. It was Jack Kirby. It's like, dude, you, you can see all kinds of comics that Jack Kirby created on his own. And while beautiful and even some good concepts in them, they were they weren't the success that the stuff that he created with uh Stan Lee were and you know yeah just and a, Stan uh, Lee 
Stanley has so many successes under his belt, so many just iconic characters under his belt. And I'll be blunt, like I've read a lot of his older stuff. It is dated. Um, it doesn't like uh, it's it's it feels but like that's 60s also, writing. Yeah, but it's also with the context the of what but we yeah. think of as <laughs> comics now. Like that's but yeah, it, it, he and he, then yeah, I mean, just I was just gonna say like people who take like like he'll have great ideas for these characters, and then writers who come by later and start writing, uh, kind of evolving these ideas, and then yeah, you get some great stuff from it. X Men being a prime example. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Chris Paramount did an amazing amount of work for X Men, kind of evolving those ideas. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. Uh, also, R.I.P. John Romita Senior. We said that before, but it's worth saying again. Um, it was always a collaboration, and uh, it's just you know, there people like to pick their 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 guy. Sometimes it seems like. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh no, Jack Kirby was the one. It's like, yeah, you know, they both did. And mm -hmm. and I don't think I think if any of the if the pairings had been any different at all, there would be it would it would we would not know who some of these characters are. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, that's yeah. enough. Well, let's let's get the you know straight from the horse's mouth herself. Let's hear what uh, Ayn Rand, you know, the the mother of all this bullshit uh yeah. what you you know the founding principles of all this stuff mm. use another word self-esteem the value of selfishness is that you esteem yourself as a value that you live according to your nature which means by the judgment of your own mind and you respect your own mind you respect your own ability to do the right thing Okay, thank you. Yes, this is strange brain parts. Brain parts. Yes. Okay. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It is a good channel. I've been thinking about doing another, like, here's some channels we should, I don't know, check out kind of stream. And that was one I thought about. Therefore, you respect. So for anybody that doesn't, just kind of, she's got thick with a, what is that? Uh, is that German? She, she I German? believe she's Russian. Russian. Please say moose and squirrel. Yeah, <laughs> um, she uh, she's talking about selfishness being a virtue. It's actually good to be selfish. Yeah, um, she's Russian. The, the possibility of being a morally virtuous person, and you regard yourself as a value worth preserving. Let me bring it down from Kant a little bit to a bromide that I had drummed into me as a child, and maybe you've heard it. Happiness comes from making other people happy. Oh, yes. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't heard it? And that's the trouble. Let's aim at the day when people will not hear it anymore. Because it isn't true. It isn't justifiable. And the first question you would have to ask is, why? Why is it good to want... So, I kind of feel like the, the appropriate thing is like in between there somewhere. Yes, you have to take care of yourself, absolutely. And you have to take care of yourself in order mm -hmm. to take care of anybody else. It's like a, absolutely. A, a, if you're a parent, you can't just like put all of your focus and energy, 100% of it into your kid, because then you're fucking destroying yourself and like mm -hmm. not taking, and then you're going to eventually, in the you know, long run, that's not going to be good for the kid anyway. Others to be happy, but not yourself. And I suppose you will be told that, well, but they will work for your happiness and not their own. Well, it's like an exchange of Christmas presents that neither party wants, but that you have to exchange presents and you're not allowed morally to do something for yourself. Whereas what I say, you can make others happy when and if those others mean something to you selfishly. If you love them, then you want to make them happy. Now, I think it's interesting because you see her just essentially, she's, used, she's trying to use reason to explain why. Um, you know, oh, so, uh, you know, being being selfless is bad, which is uh, it's, it's so like essentially her argument is, uh, you know, oh, well, actually uh, taking care of others is selfishness. And it's like, well, not let's, let's, necessarily, man, and I got a brain breaker for you. Mm. Why? Why is she? Why did she write books? Why did she go on shows and do these speeches, talks and stuff like that? Because that's technically like doing for others, right? Yeah. 
she's doing this for these for the benefit of other people to learn this no so like isn't that kind of contradictory yeah if i mean if she thinks it's important to teach other people this stuff then yeah why why you know she's it's, it's yeah. a bit contradictory i mean of course i'm sure she was getting paid as well so mm-hmm. uh but at the same time she yeah she did she was receiving uh social security uh mm-hmm. upon death and I've seen some some uh, libertarians trying to justify that one, like, oh, well, she paid into it. And it's like, everybody did, you fucking moron. Yeah. So then, <laughs> then you shut the fuck up, because literally everybody fucking pays into Social Security. If you fucking work, you pay into it. So, like, it, 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 that doesn't, if you're giving that excuse for Ayn Rand, you give it for everybody else. <laughs> no, I, I think that's funny. It's like, oh, well, she paid into it. Yeah. Uh, who doesn't pay into social security. I, I see that deduction on my paycheck. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yep. She's a proto grifter. Exactly. Um. <laughs> Fine. If you don't love them, that's not a moral crime. You don't have to love everybody. You cannot love everybody because it's a meaningless expression. You can love only those whom you value and if they contribute to your happiness, you contribute to theirs. That's fine. But each one of you has to be selfish about it. Supposing somebody were in love with you and said, I, I love you because you're so bad. So I sacrifice myself and I'm going to love you. Would you accept? It, uh, okay, sorry. I'm that or no would man. you say it's the most? No, sir, I wouldn't either. That's the most insulting thing anyone could have said to you and yet that's what altruism would demand and there is a great russian writer who tried to practice it dostoevsky who did marry a poor uh, stupid little uh, seamstress i love how they're just like smoking cigarettes <laughs> yeah oh yeah no yeah ellie's kind of driving nuts because like I remember back in, I'm old enough to remember like being just used to smelling cigarettes indoors. Just used yeah, to it. Same. And now is whenever whenever I smell cigarette, I'm like, oh God. Ugh. It's fucking worse. I mean, I smoked for a long time. So like but mm-hmm. like now when I smell them, I get, I literally will get a headache if I fucking mm-hmm. smell a cigarette. Uh I I I thought it was most interesting in bars because I remember like when they passed the law, I was like, oh, they can't do that in a bar, right? And then and then oh. uh, every once in a while in a bar, you you smell somebody light well up, and it's like, oh God, no. <laughs> so this is this is the last time I'll, I'll address you, but I do I do want to praise you for getting on topic. Okay, you are on topic. However, because you spent so much time focused on the other shit, you've completely misconstrued anything that we've said about this topic. What? Um, because when we have you... not. <laughs> we've literally said the exact opposite from the beginning yeah. of this stream. We we were um, arguing that he's very much not a libertarian or a Randian character. <laughs> Yeah, so Just, I mean, like I said, kudos getting on topic. Eh, got to deduct so points from. We <laughs> agree. <laughs> we, we we agree exactly. <laughs> Who wh- whom he didn't love at all, out of the desire to make her happy. You see, the end of it was she committed suicide. Now that is an altruist practice. That's what altruism leads to. How about it's more blessed to give than to receive? So she she gave a freaking anecdote of someone who killed yeah. themselves. Uh, <laughs> anecdotal person, evidence is real evidence guys don't look at statistics they lie don't. this this person killed themselves therefore the only possible thing that could, could have caused that is the thing that i am happening to happen to be yeah. against um no what, evidence what, of that. how convenient <laughs> jesus christ yeah it couldn't be that uh you know i don't know it just nonsensical man it's it's fucking crazy that anybody ever really bought into this shit but then mm-hmm. you know. i mean I, I, so like, God, it was probably a while ago, but there was a period where I uh, was reading books by Terry Goodkind. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're familiar with Terry Goodkind, he did like this huge fantasy series. And in the middle of the series, and it's actually a decent book, like all of a sudden, uh, the main character becomes like, takes a, uh, like he changes, like how he's written is, cha- it is very different. And I realized because I was like, this is weird. And then I look into it and I realize the, the writer became like pretty much an objectivist during that point. And so he was writing the main character as like an and Rand objects, objectivists, uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I started like researching this stuff and I, uh, and Rand is weird. Like I, so there's, there's points where I agree with her and points where I cannot disagree more. 
And I just, I find it interesting how like people want to almost build a religion around her as if like she knew it all when she's clearly wrong on lots and lots of things. You know, I mean, and, and, and honestly, also, some of her, some of her base points are points where they would, won't even acknowledge her. <laughs> well, I mean, and also just like the, the fact that, um, Nah, you pretty much nailed it. Uh, it's <laughs> she's uh, it's nonsensical, and and, and oh, that people name their kids after him. Look at Rand Paul. Yes, <laughs> it's literally who he's named after. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> you know, like what are you doing, <laughs> Ron Paul? You fucking crazy fucker, crazy <laughs> old bitch. Had me. He had me for a second. I'm not gonna lie. For in 2012, he had me for like a, a hot second. I was uh, I was like, yeah, this guy's pretty good. And then I started looking into his affiliations and how he's like cool with taking photos with like clan members and shit like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And that's just basically, um, you know, that's a good summary of how libertarianism tends to operate right there. But there's a series of images that some of you may have seen called Libertarian Spider Man. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and they are golden. Libertarian Spider Man. Not that I do it, but the government making it illegal for me to shoot heroin while flying in, in a plane is literally rape. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I didn't know it was literally. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's uh, <laughs> literally. Uh, <laughs> okay. Got another one here. Uh Fire departments are socialism. I should have left this to the free market. <laughs> yes. Oh, can, can you pay to put out that fire? Oh, I mean, if exactly. you can't pay, you libertarian, well <laughs> libertarian Spider Man is is who he was before he yeah. before Uncle Ben got killed. Basically, yeah, that was he was actually legit. Canonically, he was a libertarian for a hot minute whenever he went and did the wrestling match and stuff because he was trying to make mm -hmm. money. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, I almost want to say like Spider Man from Family Guy would be kind of libertarian, except he at least gives everybody one. <laughs> yeah, the I funny watermark is what drives it home for sure. Yeah, <laughs> really sells it. Um, this one doesn't have one though, so it's not going to be as funny. He's in jail. This is literally exactly the same <laughs> as voting. This is clearly an iconic character and how Spider-Man should have been written, right? <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, this is Ditko's version right here. <laughs> My God. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, is that a legacy Spider-Man? Like a legacy version? I mean, this is this is how Spider-Man would be written if like if if Chuds had their way, basically. Um, not my problem. You know? I don't know. I feel like there's a bit more depth to that character than there is to Isom, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> True. True. I at least get what this guy's about. Yeah. <laughs> at know, least this three, guy's got great lines. I mean, you know. Three <laughs> images, and I get what he's about. Yeah. Compared to the, what is it, 90-something pages of Isom, one that I read, and I still have no well, idea what that dude believes. Yeah, I've only read 90. I guess there's a hundred, probably like 180 now, and I still can't tell you anything that I've heard about it, but that's good. <laughs> Man, that'd be funny if they did put that him in a, one hilarious. of the spider pieces. <laughs> I mean, they do have a couple of joke characters, so they could definitely could put him in there. Yeah. Just, he is the one that is not helpful, like, at all. And then, like, all the other spider men like, beat the shit out of him. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking nerd. Dude, you're not even with the villains. What's wrong with you? <laughs> hey, Superior Spider-Man is not evil. Hey, he's, he uh, starts out evil. I, I'll say he starts out evil. True. Like, true. Yeah, there's there's an evolution. The the I brilliant thing, it, but yeah, the brilliant twist about uh, Superior Spider-Man is the fact that he still hears like he hears like Peter's as his conscience kind of thing, like that is fucking brilliant. Um, and so he like is is and he gets all the memories right. So like that was that was because when I first heard that like oh Doctor Octopus is Doctor Octopus is taking over Peter's body, he's gonna be Spider-Man. It's like what? That's fucking yeah, crazy and stupid. And why would you, you know, I didn't understand why anybody would want to read that. And then 
you hear that the rest of it and it's like okay i see where you're yeah. coming from dan slot you son of a bitch i haven't read a lot of it but what i've read is like surprisingly good um so yeah <laughs> still hoping for japanese spider-man in the movies um was he not in i thought he was in um uh, across the spider-verse see i i have to, i've only seen it the once um i would love to watch it again it was a great movie but yeah um uh I think he was supposed to be there, but I don't remember him there. But that being said, you know, there's a like at least a hundred Spider-Man in there, so missing one wouldn't blow my mind. <laughs> what? I mean, video game Spider-Man was there. <laughs> Maybe they just weren't ready to give Leopardon enough screen time yet. Yeah. You know? uh, he actually has a whole arc for the next movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. Uh, well, what do we got? What, what are we on next? Uh, let's see. Did you have any our libertarian heroes to dive into, or is it no? Is there's it? really just the one. I mean, Ooh. you know, there's like there's there's Mr. A, there's Rorschach. What? You know, that's the thing. Like, can we actually even call them heroes? At not that? not really. That's kind of what the point the point of it is, yeah. right? Like, there's literally impossible to be a libertarian hero because here's the thing: libertarians are bad people. I'm sorry. They're just sorry. They're just like you know, and that doesn't mean there's that they're like uh, yeah, fundamentally I, bad. They can change, but as long as they are subscribed to libertarianism, they are bad people. Yeah, and I I, I want to stress there's elements of the philosophy that are absolutely fine, like you know, lib like, and most people don't even subscribe to these philosophies. But like you know, libertarians would be you know, like you know, gay rights, trans rights, all that stuff. They'd be a hundred percent for and hey. Me too. I can I can work for libertarian on stuff like that. They don't usually like to talk about that though. <laughs> yeah, and we we did have there's some discussion about that in my new video that came out yesterday. Mm -hmm. That uh, quite a lot of you have seen I think so far because it's getting some pretty good numbers. So I appreciate that. Well, I mean, I do think it's interesting how anytime you talk to a, a very public uh, libertarian who likes to tout about their libertarianism uh, to other people. Um, their views seem to ally more with conservatism than libertarianism, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, wow, you guys sure do send for that, uh, the, the GOP a lot. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, I guess really the when you think about it, the, the dark money that's gone into all this shit for the last several, you know, a decade at least, uh, the Koch brothers are hardcore libertarians. Uh, a lot of the money that funds a lot of the conservative propaganda that takes that goes around and shit is libertarian money. So it really kind of is as if they're backdooring libertarianism into mainstream GOP branding. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's kind of what seems to have happened. Kind of like Scam Lee. Exactly. Mm. <sighs> Yeah, this fucking way that they have like inverted the idea of gay and, and trans rights and stuff. And it's like, no, they're they're against it because that's enforcing asking them to respect their their identities is enforcing something on them. That's how they seem to have fucking perverted the concept of libertarianism in, in that way. It's fucking cringe, stupid. Don't do it. It's bad. To just give me a character motivation for Isom. Why does okay, it go? So why does he look for Jasmine? Because his sister asked to ask him to do it. All right. So why does he say yes? Because he he cares about his family, specifically considering that this is a family friend, and he knows that his mother would chew his ass out in the event that that's all explained in the text. So he's literally just looking for this girl because his mom would chew him out if he didn't. Yes. <laughs> 